Let me get the sound. Good morning, all the saints of God and those who desire to be a saint of God. Welcome here, Birmingham, Alabama, at Power Christian Fellowship Church Sunday School. Our pastor is Darren Ray Moss, and I am the teacher, Randolph Lampkin. Let's pray. O oh Lord, God Almighty, how excellent is thy name is in all the earth. We come to you, dear Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, praising and worshiping your holy name, lifting up the name of Jesus by the power of your sweet Holy Spirit, asking that you will forgive us for all of our sins, have mercy on us for sins committed. Wash our sins away with the precious shed blood of Jesus. Cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Wash our sins clean and spotless, whiter than snow. We thank you, Father, for the, the great gift of eternal life, salvation by grace through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ that you sent down from heaven over 2,000 years ago almost and here we just want to say again we love you father we love you lord jesus we love you sweet holy spirit because you first loved us have your way with your word today and your ministers clergy and laity who are handling your word that we have studied and teach the truth of god's holy word we lift up the name of jesus forgive those who are suffering today from so many things have mercy on them sick shut in bereaved jail persecuted and hungry you know them we pray for them and with them but here we just give you all the praise the glory the honor the blessing the thanksgiving through lord jesus christ and only begotten son in his precious holy and righteous name we pray hallelujah glory to god and we, your children, say amen, amen, amen. Thank God, thank God, thank God. This beautiful lesson today is one that continues in the Acts of the Apostles. Well, the Lord Jesus Christ is still at work by the Holy Spirit through the Apostles in Judea and Samaria. And it covers chapters 8 through 12 of the epistle the third, to Acts. And here we see that this lesson here is lesson 13, May 28, 2023. Saul of Tarsus. Oh, we worship God. First day of the week, the Lord's Day. Resurrection Sunday, Holy Communion. And Saul of Tarsus is one that is very interesting in the scriptures. It's a man who just hated the Messiah. And Saul of Tarsus is a Pharisee. He was very devout to the Judea the religion God gave Israel Judaism and Paul was a staunch proponent of it he is one who lived in Tarsus again he was a Pharisee he was raised as a Roman he was a Roman citizen but he did not embrace that citizenship he he clung to Judaism to Jerusalem, to Israel. Here we see that Tarsus is the chief city of Cilicia in Eastern Asia Minor. We know it today as modern Turkey. And I will lesson focus. Will you minister to your enemies in Jesus' name? Now, ministering to your enemies is learning and attending to others needs and the key is giving them the gospel of salvation 
of the Lord Jesus Christ, that they too might be saved. We are doing the Lord's work representing Christ as his agents here on earth. We're all supposed to be involved. And your enemies, as we know, are someone who seek to bring harm against you, who just don't like you, and many instances just hate you. But God gives us authority in the name of Jesus where certain actions are authoritatively performed with to do all of God's work in the name of Jesus. We're doing it to the glory of God by the power of the Holy Spirit so that the Father will be glorified in the Son and the Son glorified in the Father. Jesus has designated all believers with that authority. He said, if you ask the Father of anything, ask it in his name. So here we see the first subtopic is God calls Ananias and Ananias protests. First of all, this, this man Ananias is a disciple uh, up in Damascus. He is a Christian. He's Jewish. But he did not live in Israel. So we see that God is calling him. Uh, he is bidding him, inviting him to, to, to certain actions that he will make request of this man. He's asking him to make a decision to do his will. And that is, we'll find out later. Ananias uh, uh, really protests God's bidding and inviting. Uh, his name means uh, the Lord is gracious. And again, he is a Christian disciple of Jesus living in Damascus. He had to be a, a man of God that God could depend on to invite him to this service that God had need for. And I was, this covers Acts chapter 9, verses 9 through 14. Our second subtopic is God responds and Ananias obeys. Acts chapter 9, verses 15 through 17. And respond is simply to reply uh, to an answer in words. And obey, obeys is to follow the commands, to carry out the commands, in this instance, of God. God desires our obedience. All children of God, by faith in Jesus Christ, he desires our obedience. And here in this key verse, Acts chapter 9, verse 17 and it reads, And Ananias went his way and entered into the house, and putting his hands on him, said, Brother Saul, the Lord even Jesus that appeared unto thee in the way as thou camest, has sent me that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. God is doing a wonderful work and the apostle Paul through a disciple of his named Ananias. Ananias is one that we can readily associate with because this man is one who loves God. Even though he had a protest, he still showed that he loved God in his obedience to God's will. Chapter 9 um, covers conversion of Saul of Tarsus. Saul of Tarsus is a son of Shem. You remember last week we told about how the world is divided into three divisions after the flood. Noah and his wife were saved and his three sons, Ham, Shem, and Japheth. 
and their wives. So these are the ones who replenish the earth after the flood because everyone and everything that had life was drowned except the dove that God told Noah to bring into the ark. And he wanted the dove to go out from time to time, God did, and see if the the waters had abated. At first they had covered all of the mountains and trees on the mountains and the dove would return back to the ark. But later on, the dove did not return. So the water was abating and God was had fulfilled his judgment on planet earth because he said the earth was full of violence and disobedience rebellion and God basically wiped out all of humanity other than Noah and his wife and his three sons and their wives so we here we see that here's another division of the human race we saw last week that Ham uh, son the Ethiopian eunuch the black man uh, we saw Philip up in Samaria uh, carrying on a, a, a preaching, teaching ministry where he was bringing people to Christ in the cities of the Samaritans. But now we see that we go to the second sign of Noah, Shem. And Saul is a sign of Shem. Remember we said that they are Semites. They, they are out of the Middle East and those Semitic people of, of that day, they come through the loins of Shem. And this lesson will show the conversion of the Apostle Paul. He was a staunch believer in Judaism to the law. He, he, he did not play when it came to his religion. And anyone who went against the grain, against something that was not in the law, they had to pay for it. And in this instance, Saul is wreaking havoc against the early church where on the day of Pentecost brought the various languages to these 120, including the 11 apostles, to speak in the languages of these Jews who were not from Jerusalem, Israel. They were scattered at that time, a lot of them around the, Med the countries and, uh, of the Mediterranean uh, Sea, uh, some were in Europe. And here we find that this man Saul is one who was in his birthplace where he was born at the time of Tarsus. But now he's in Jerusalem. He is from parents who wanted the best for their son. His uh, father was a, a, a Jewish Roman. They had Roman citizenship, but Saul never did embrace it. He was staunch to the law of Israel, but his parents sent him back as he was a child to study under the great Hebrew scholar Gamaliel. And Paul no doubt had been educated in, in the best of the schools uh, of that day, even the, the, the Greek uh, university, uh, yeah, as a matter of fact, the university of Tarsus. It was the greatest Greek university of that day. So Paul was highly educated, not only as a student with, with the academics, but even a student in the law of Moses. Here we find that this man is, we'd like to give a little detail before we get to our uh, lesson, um, the conversion of Saul of Tarsus. 
Now, in verses 1 and 2 of the book of Acts, chapter 9, reads, And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughters against the disciples of the Lord, went into, unto the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues. That is, he asked the, the rulers of that day, chief priests, the scribes, all of the uh, elders and the high priests, chief priests, even those who had authority in Jerusalem in the religious hierarchy. He asked them for letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, that is, of the way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. You remember in John chapter 14, verse 6, Jesus said to Thomas, doubting Thomas, I am the way. And this is what Paul uh, 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 was wanted to hunt them down who had who were in the way those who had come to christ to be saved jesus said i am the way the truth and the life no man cometh unto the father but by me so paul was a, a very true pharisee uh one who was staunched in the law of moses the judaism who who believed the ladder of the law and really lived by it. So he wanted to, to bound men and women, bring them back to Jerusalem. This man is one who wants to exterminate the Christians because they were going against the tradition of men. It had nothing to do necessarily well, what thus say the word of God? You see, Paul had been studying the law all of these years. He was a brilliant young man. He was no doubt one of the most brilliant men or uh, the most brilliant man of his day. Highly educated and highly educated in the law on the Gamaliel. So Paul was not going to play with anyone who was going against the traditions of the law of Judaism. So he wanted to kill all of the Christians. He wanted to bound them, men and women. He, 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 he wanted to ferret them out anywhere in the world, in the Roman Empire. He wanted to hunt and search them, search for them as though he was a bounty hunter who would bring them back to Jerusalem bound and eventually they would be killed. So this man is one who is totally against the Lord. He's, he's a brilliant young man, but yet he is a dumb young man because he had studied the law of Moses, he had been raised in Judaism. He studied the scriptures, the Old Testament. It spoke of the coming of the Messiah. Many prophets can go all the way back to Genesis where Moses wrote that book and he even touched on the one who would uh, come against Christ one day through Eve, Satan. He will injure Jesus, but Jesus ultimately will exterminate Satan. So here we see uh, Paul, Saul at this time, Verses 3 and 4, and as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. 
And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecuted thou me? You remember the Bible says, God is light. And Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He even told his apostles, ye are the light of the world. And he's telling all believers, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father, which is in heaven. You see, when anyone persecute the church, that person or those people are actually persecuting the body of Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember, he is the head and we are his body. So Paul was probably trying to determine what is going on here. He, he had never seen Jesus any more perhaps than at his crucifixion. He had no personal encounters with him. Remember, Jesus would enter Jerusalem from time to time, but most of the time he did not stay very long. He did not ever spend a night in Jerusalem. He made his headquarters up in Galilee at Capernaum. And Paul had heard much about this man. Many people had heard much about Jesus. But Paul did not understand anything about Jesus, not really, nor did he know him. In verse 5, and he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus whom thou persecuted. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. You see what Jesus is saying here now. He's given uh, uh, an example of, of agriculture of, of that day. When the farmer had his oxen together and they were plowing the field, they were developing rows in the field so that the seeds could be planted at some time and crop would grow. But the oxen sometimes would not stay on that straight path that the farmers uh, wanted the oxen to travel. They would veer off sometime. So the farmers had what, what they call an, an ox goat. And this was a, a wooden stick about eight feet long that had a metal tip on it so that when the oxen would veer off the farmer would prod him and in the process of priding the oxen or the ox would kick at the ox cord further injuring himself more than just the pride so jesus is giving an example here of, of, of that situation with paul he said, it is hard for thee to get kick against the pricks, the ox gold. That is, if you continue to kick against me, you will further injure yourself more than if you would just originally do my will. So here we see in verse 6, and he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. You see, at this point, Paul is saved. He is a saved man. He immediately comes to Christ and obey him. Saul is, is, is right down in the dust. Picture that. He, he is perhaps uh, riding a donkey, and he is on his face, on his knees perhaps, and the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. You see, Paul now had to go into the city of Damascus. He was down on his face, on his knees, in the dust. He's confused, but he recognized that this has to be the Lord. He hated the Lord Jesus Christ with a passion. And he now 
is submitting to him and calling him Lord and saying, what will thou have me to do? Now, he is ready to do the bidding of the Lord. Now, he has been completely changed. Listen to Matthew 7 and 20. Wherefore, well, by their fruits ye shall know them. Well, we can surely tell what has happened to this man. He has been changed. He has been born again. Say now in verse seven, and the men which journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no man. Later on, we will see Paul give his accounts of this in Acts twenty uh, two and chapter twenty six, and he will continue in the book of Philippians, and even in uh, he spoke of it some in Galatia, but Paul couldn't understand this. He heard a voice. He saw no man. He saw this shining light. This was the Shekinah glory that blinded this man, Paul. Those who were with him heard a voice. They saw no man, but they could not understand the words. They too were speechless and in amazement. Now, Paul was so confused that he will later on at some point tell of this confusion. In verse verses 8 and 9 we read, And Saul arose from the earth, and when his eyes were open, he saw no man, but they led those who were with him. They led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. You see, here this man was blinded by the light. Jesus is light. He has seen this light from heaven. Here was a man who was poser as any man had ever been. He was amazed, puzzled, baffled, astonished. He was confused. Some people, when they are saved, jump up and down. Some shout for joy. But this man, Paul, he didn't do that. He was just a confused man. Remember, he was totally against Jesus. And now all of a sudden, just like that, he has received the Lord Jesus Christ as his personal Savior and Lord. He knew that Judaism, uh, the law of Moses, was a God-given law. And he's wondering now, but he's being obedient. He failed to recognize that in the law of Moses, it spoke of this Messiah who was to come. He had come. But Paul and the Pharisees, many of them, later on some of them, came to believe and receive the Lord Jesus Christ as their personal Savior and Lord. But many were lost and died in their sins, but Paul was not one of them. But he's still confused. <clears throat> now, we see if anyone had been in Damascus, any one of those three days in Paul, what has happened? His answer would have been, I don't know. He didn't know what was going on, but he is going to find out what is going on. In verses 10 through 12, we read, And there was a certain disciple at Damascus, named Ananias. And to him said the Lord in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Behold, I am here, Lord. And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the street, which is called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas, for one called Saul, of Tarsus, for behold, he prayed, and has seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him that he might receive his sight. You see how the Lord deals with uh, his children, those who are not his children, even as the Apostle Paul was at that time. Now, yes, he, 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 he followed the law of Moses, Judaism, the Mosaic law. But now God says, 
Jesus has fulfilled the law. See, Jesus is the total fulfillment of the law. He said, for the Son of Man came not to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. And Paul was still going against God's will by continuing to follow the law. Jesus, the law, the law is a, it, it, it is a death sentence. It, it, it tells man, it shows man that you and I cannot keep the law because the law demands the soul that sin it, it shall die. Can't keep the law. So he sent, God did, one from heaven, his only begotten son, Jesus, to fulfill every dot and tittle of the law. He never broke a law in the Mosaic law, although the people broke the law all the time. No sacrifice had to be made for Jesus in breaking the law that thereby sinning. But the priests, the high priests, made sacrifices for the sin of the people, or even those priests, every day. Jesus never had a sacrifice offered to the Lord for him because he is the perfect sacrifice. He said, for the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, that is to serve, but to minister, that is to serve, and to seek and to save that which was lost. He said, I came not to do mine own will, but to do the will of the Father who sent me. See, here we find that this man, Paul, is confused. He don't know what's happening. Yes, he's a brilliant young man. He's sitting in darkness and confusion, trying to make sense of what's going on. The spirit of God comes to another man, Ananias, and sends him over to Saul. Now, he told Ananias, God did, uh, uh, and, and also told Paul that this man will come to him and he was to go into the street called Straight over in Damascus, Syria. That street is still there, Straight Street. And he said, and has seen in a vision a man named Ananias. See, God, when he does things, he does all things well. He gave the division to Paul that a man named Ananias would come to him and lay his hands on his hand on him that he might receive his sight. But he has to set it up so that both of these men will be obedient to receive the word of God and do the will of God. Now, the, then Ananias, verses 13 through 16, then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard many th things of this man and how much evil he had done to thy saints at Jerusalem. You see, it all happened with the stoning of Stephen. Paul was there sitting given uh, the go ahead and holding the coats of those who stoned Stephen to death. He was there. He saw it. But there's something that perhaps happened to him at that time too. Here we see that verses 14, 15, and 16. And here he had authority from the chief priest to bind all that call on that name. That is to arrest all that call on that name. He was a bounty hunter who was not seeking pay. His pay was that he would kill the Christians who were going against the tradition, the law of Moses. Judaism. 
But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. That is, I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. And when we read uh, the New Testament, there are various uh, uh, epistles of, of the Apostle Paul. We see that this man suffered, we believe, in a way that no other person has ever suffered for the Lord Jesus Christ. In this lesson, God states two reasons for calling Saul. He was chosen by God as his chosen vessel. And he was first to bear the name of Jesus. Notice that he is not called a witness as the disciples were. He was, was to bear the name of Jesus. Although Paul may have seen Jesus at his crucifixion, he had not walked with him in the days of his flesh as the other 12 disciples had. He really knew nothing about Jesus. He just knew of him. He heard about him. He, he never was really in his presence in the way of a disciple or apostle. And he would finally find out who Jesus was on his way, on the road to Damascus, to search out, hunt down all of the Christians, man and woman, to bound them and bring them back to Jerusalem for execution. He is to bear the name of Jesus. That is the same name that every believer today is to bear. We are to bear the name of Jesus. We cannot operate in the world as though we are not believers of Christ because the world is looking at Christians and they tell me, they told me before that too many people are fake and phony and they don't believe that this thing is really real, but I have to stress the point to them. Don't look at those people. God will judge them. Jesus will judge them one day, but he will also judge you if you do not come to him in confession of sin and repent and receive the gift of salvation from God, eternal life in Jesus. Don't look at those people. They have to answer to the Lord one day for themselves, just as you will and I will. But when we receive Jesus as our personal Savior, Lord, we cannot be hypocrites. We cannot be fake phonies. He wants, the Lord wants us to be real. But here, Paul is going to bear the name of Jesus before three different groups. He is to bear the name of Jesus before the Gentiles and kings too, and the nation of Israel. Three. Paul is 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 the one who uh, will become the apostle to the Gentiles, even though the scriptures declares to the Jew first and then to the Gentile. God has ordained Paul, who is a Jew, to take the message, the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ throughout the Roman Empire, Asia Minor, and other places. So we see that this man will appear also before to kings and the children of Israel. Notice that Paul will probably appear even to Nero, who was the king in Rome of that day, he, he was called bloody Negro, Nero because he was so vicious to Christians. And Paul 
will be about doing nothing but the will of the Lord Jesus Christ. Just as he was a staunch advocate for Judaism, the law of Moses, he has done a 180 degree turnaround doing the will of the Lord Jesus Christ, that is to preach the word of God, the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, how Christ suffered, bled, died, and was buried, and God raised him up from the dead on the third day, according to the scripture. He will be even more so now. We thought that this man was a, a zealot, a, a, a fanatic in Judaism, and yes, he was, but you will see one now who, who will go farther against that grain in his bout, in his belief, in his willing to do the master's will for Christianity. There's no turning back. He's a staunch believer now because he himself has met the Lord Jesus Christ on the Damascus road. We see Paul now must secondly uh, he, he, he must suffer many things. Jesus said yes I suffered for the sins of the world past, present and future. No one has ever suffered like the Lord Jesus Christ bar none. Because Jesus took upon himself the sins of the whole world from the past, the present, and the future. Imagine this, people. The Bible says, the soul that sinned, it shall die. If one law in the law of Moses was broken, God was to bring wrath upon that individual just for one but think about all of us since we were born and up until now of the many sins that we have committed just as an individual randolph lampkin put your name there and think about all of the people and and and, and not only for one sin but there are other sins not the same that we we, we commit in all of those sins and God placed all of these sins on Jesus as his perfect sin bearer. And he brought the wrath of God upon Jesus. It, it, was, it was not a light thing. It was not a fun thing. That's why Jesus, uh, uh, when he was praying with his disciples as they left the upper room, uh, and they went into the Mount of Olives and into the Garden of Gethsemane where Jesus told his apostles to pray with him. And he went further from them about a stone's throw and prayed to the Father. And, and the Bible says Jesus was, was sweating drops of blood. This is how intense it was. This was a... A horrific experience for our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and Jesus in his humanity on his knees praying to the Father said if it be possible Father if it be possible take this cup from me that was his humanity remember he's both man and God he's the God man the perfect man but he experienced everything that man experienced emotionally and everything yet he never sinned paul said it this way he said for he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of god in him jesus never sinned but in the flesh praying to god he said if it be father if it be possible take this cup from me but he did not even answer wait for an answer he went immediately and said but not my will, but thine will be done. He was ready. Shortly after then, he was arrested by the high priest 
and, and, and the soldiers and Judas Iscariot that betrayed him with a kiss. Thereby he went to the judgment halls of Pilate and Herod from judgment hall to judgment hall all day, all night long, whipped horribly all night long. But see, Jesus knew what the wrath, the wrath of God and the suffering, but on that cross between the sixth hour and the ninth hour, the whole earth became dark. God would not let sinful man see how he was dealing with his only begotten son. It was pitch black darkness. God dealt with Jesus in these three hours from 12 noon to 3 o'clock p.m. The wrath of God was manifested upon Jesus. See, we don't know just how it is when God brings us to places where we need to to, to listen to him. We need to, 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 to listen just as the apostle Paul did. He knew that as God told him that he would suffer many things for Jesus' name's sake. And Paul suffered horribly. Not on the scale of the Lord Jesus Christ, but we believe that no other man has ever suffered for the cause of Christ like the Lord Jesus Christ. Some people say I'm suffering. I don't know why God is doing this, putting all of this on me. Well, the reason is that God let all of his children go through situations. He's bringing us to a place where he wants us to, to come close to him. We might be close. But he said, I always want you closer, Randolph. It's not enough. I have greater heights to take you. Put your name there. If you are really a child of God by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, you will. You will experience some persecution, some suffering. Here we see that suffering are more than we think. Paul suffered. At any rate, none of us have suffered as the Apostle Paul suffered, even though we think that our suffering at time is great. We also see that uh, this is a remarkable conversion in that uh, you remember we said even last week and today that conversion requires the Holy Spirit and the Word of God and a man of God. And we will see all of this taking place with Saul. Now, the question is, where was the man of God in Saul's conversion? The man of God was earlier as he watched Stephen and gave permission for Stephen to be stoned to death. He, he aligned himself with these killers. But he didn't expect what he saw with Stephen. Stephen, as he was stoned, being stoned to death, he told the father, lay not these charge against them. And then he said, I see Jesus standing at the right hand of God. He looked up into heaven he was looking in heaven at Jesus, whom Jesus was telling Stephen, yes, you are stoning, but you will be with me shortly. Stephen was the first martyr of the early church. And we see that Paul watched this man, Stephen, stone, and he looked in his face and say, something is real about this. I want to be able to look into heaven myself. He began to ponder at that point, not knowing exactly what he thought. But here we find that the word of God must come. The Holy Spirit, the man, the, 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 
the Holy Spirit first, the Word of God, and the Man of God. Paul has got gotten baptized with the Holy Spirit. That is, he has been saved. And the Word of God has given him the direction of the will of God. And the man of God was none other than the one he gave permission by these killers to stone Stephen to death. It must come together. We see that Paul is one who is a great, brilliant man, even in Judaism. He followed the law. And he was really staunch. But he failed to see that the law pointed to Christ. He could not continue in the law because, the, again, the law is a persecutor. The law will determine that you receive death. The Holy Spirit and the Word of God were operative in Paul's conversion. Now, Stephen was that human instrument that God used as Paul gave the authority that he had received from the chief priests and all of those religious leaders to allow these people to stone Stephen to death. It's a wonderful thing when, 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 when you can look at a, a man of God who is really real as Stephen was. He was a preaching deacon. And here we see in, in Acts chapter 7 and 56, Stephen said, I see heaven open and Jesus standing there. That's something to see when the Lord reveals himself from heaven. And he did it on the same day uh, when Paul was on the Damascus road. He revealed himself from heaven. To Paul, I believe that God uses a human instrument. He must in the conversion of every individual. Whether that instrument has gone on to be with the Lord, such as a parent who probably had been, been, been preaching and teaching to their lost son or daughter to, to, to come to Christ, even though there was rebellion in the family and they would not. And they will go to their death oftentimes, go on to heaven, still preaching for that son or daughter before that time. And they may not see it later on, but a time will come in many instances where that son or daughter would come to Christ and be saved. That was the human instrument. The Holy Spirit, the Word of God, and a human instrument. Man must be used. Here we see that Jesus is the one that we should cast our influence at all times because people are watching us and they want to see if you really for real. Because if you talk to them about Jesus and you're not living the life, they'll give you the hand. You can go on with that. You need to be telling that to yourself. Tell me about that church. What you're doing. You need to be saved. Even though a person say. I am saved. You don't look like it. You don't act like it. I don't believe you. Because I know how a Christian would act. Yes believers know that. And unbelievers know that. Here we find. Uh, this man Ananias. He is going. Uh, to come to Paul. And he will. Be obedient to the Lord. And let's read verse 17. And Ananias went his way and entered into the house and putting his hands on him, just as the Lord said, said, Brother Saul, he's a brother now. Jesus is telling him, he's one of my chosen vessels, just like you are. He calls him, Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus, that appeared unto thee in the way as thou camest, has sent me that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. 
You see, my brothers and sisters, we cannot do the will and the work of God unless we are filled with the Holy Spirit. We cannot serve the Lord in the way that the Lord is pleased. Now, we can say we're Christians and we're living like the devil. We cannot do the will of God in that setting. We must confess sins and repent and walk the straight and narrow road of God by following Christ. What does Paul say? Follow me as I follow Christ. Our children are looking at us. Folk whom we work with in the community, wherever. And you are living like the devil. You are not and cannot be filled with the Holy Ghost. I'm not saying that those who are filled with the Holy Ghost are perfect. But we recognize when we sin, we confess that sin and repent immediately. Like David did. The Bible says David was quick to repent. And then we pray for God's filling of the Holy Spirit. Minister Moss and I, Randolph Lampley, we cannot effectively teach the word of God if we are in sin. The Holy Spirit must be involved to fill us where he would teach us the truth of God's word. Pray for the filling of the Holy Spirit, saints. Get out of that road of unrighteousness wherever you may be. God is not pleased with you. Jesus is coming back one day and we do not want to be caught in sin and the Lord is coming rapturing his church that's not a good way for for us to be met by the lord let's get right where we're not so you see paul now he has received his physical sight but more he has received his spiritual sight and ananias laid the hands on him being obedience to, to God. Even Ananias protested for a while. He said, Lord, I'm afraid of this man. Just like the other saints are. Oh, we're in hiding. We're scared of him. Now that was a, a very, very truthful expression that he gave the Lord. But the Lord basically said, I've already talked with him too, Ananias. He's one of mine too, just like you are. Go thy way. See, this is the reason, my brothers and sisters, that we, we have to stay right with the Lord because the Lord is constantly asking us to bring those who are out in the world, who are not saved, that we bring them to him. We show those who are lost who Jesus is by the way that we live. I must finish. Live a righteous life so that those who see us or know us will say this man is right. He's talking about the Lord, Jesus, the one who can save me. And I want to be saved. And he will receive many people are coming to Christ by the witness of other believers. Let's personally, if we haven't done it, do it today. Let's not be a stumbling block. Let's be a blessing. Father, we thank you for this wonderful opportunity that you have given all of your children today. We bow down before you and we thank you for allowing those who are not saved yet to hear the message of the gospel preached and taught that they too will be saved because your word says that God is willing that all men will come to repentance. You're willing that all men be saved. And that's Christians' responsibility to preach the word of God first by the life that we live. And when you open up a door, we give them the message of the gospel. 
touch the children everywhere that we become these Christians if we are not. Bless our 1015 service today at Power Christian Fellowship Church that it would be Holy Ghost filled with Holy Ghost power. Minister Moss, our pastor, and all of those who are involved, the saints who are here. Help us throughout the church of God everywhere. We give you all of the praise, the glory, the honor, the blessing, the thanksgiving through Lord Jesus Christ, our only begotten Son. We thank you for hearing, receiving, answering our prayers for Jesus' sake. Amen. We, we thank you all for joining us today. And we love you here at Power Christian Fellowship Church. But remember, God loves you more and he loves you best. God bless you all. See you.